Hey there, Ben Kissel here for Last Podcast Network. I want to tell you about my show, Abe Lincoln's Top Hat. For more than nine years, Marcus and I have strived to present you with the most accurate and honest political podcast out there. In these turbulent times, it's our intention to unite the country with impassioned debate that reaches out to the rational Americans who find their voices more muffled every day. Every week, I use my political science background, my experience running for office, along with my lifelong passion to stand up for the downtrodden, the wrongfully accused, and the invisible man and woman to bring you news like you haven't heard before. Let's face it, traditional news has failed us. We promise to always tell you the truth the best we see it, and I personally guarantee to not be swayed by hyper-partisanship, but be guided by facts. To listen, search Abe Lincoln's Top Hat on any podcast platform or go to lastpodcastnetwork.com and find it under shows. Hail yourselves, everyone. Now back to Last Podcast on the left. There's no place to escape to. This is the last podcast on the left. <laughs> That's when the cannibalism started. Father Marcus. See, si. Yes. It has been, I believe, 10 years, 20 years hmm. since I've last confessed. That brings you to me, my child. Oh, I don't want to know this. Jesus came to me last night, but I, I don't think it was Jesus because it was an Indian man. And he said to me, I'm not the devil. And I was like, great, cool. Cool. Mm -hmm. But then he told me to remove my, my pants. Father Marcus, and he told me to put my my butt. Forgive me, you're Father forgiven. Marcus. You're forgiven. Your butt, please. On my my wife's grandmother's wedding dress, <laughs> and I believing it was Jesus Christ, even in the guise of a browner man than I expected. Yes. That wedding dress now looks like a zebra costume. <laughs> All right. Well, that's not good. And it I, was not my fault. Well, and also... Jesus. Possession! Uh, possession! <laughs> okay. Well, this is the last podcast on the left. I am Ben Kissel. That's Henry... Uh, you're Marcus Parks. That I am. No kidding. And then we have Henry Zabrowski over here. Yeah, I'm over here. You're, I know where you are. All right. Well, <laughs> you know what I'm doing. I you know, know what I'm doing. Are. Yeah, I'm over here. We're finally getting spooky. Again, yeah. it feels good to be back in the pocket, to be back deep down in the pockets oh, yeah. of ghosts and spectacularios. We got a bunch of stuff going on here today. This story is, uh, it, well, it's new to me, yeah, and it's quite interesting. It's the murderous possession, the Michael Taylor story. So one of the things that we really didn't get into with our West Memphis 3 series was what we personally believe to be the real motivations and the circumstances behind the murders. Hmm. And we're still not going to get into it, but it's the opinion of at least me and Henry that the way the boys were tied up was simple misdirection, something to make the murders look ritualistic. Now, before you start yelling and punching your computer screen, this is our opinion. <laughs> okay. This is what we do believe. This is a part of what we say is that we do believe that maybe it was done by a person of the dumber persuasion. Um, let's say the stepfathers of one of the children. We're not going to get deep into it. But a part of it is that they did that to sort of throw the trail off for detectives, saying that the reason why they were tied back was so it would look super spooky, and they did it in the most half-assed, dumb way possible. All right. Yeah, this is just uh, this is a bit of a peek into the phone conversation. <laughs> that me and Henry have together. A peek into oh, the yeah, phone Oh, yeah, but what about the yelling? <laughs> you meant the yelling and then, and then me just being like, Marcus, I have to get off the phone. I'm in the middle of shit. <laughs> right. I think we got the yelling pretty well understood. Now, our reasoning is that the ligatures suggest that the West Memphis Three child murders were lust killing, something that's more in line with like a Bundy. But none of the evidence that usually accompanies a lust murder was present. So therefore, it stands to follow that the whole point was misdirection. Okay, makes yeah, sense. Yeah, Marcus, yeah, yes. <laughs> right. okay. Of course, that's, that's just our opinion, so we our don't really opinion. need to argue about that. Well, the whole no, I'm not going to argue about it, and I will do whatever it takes to prove I'm right in a court of my law. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we figured this week, in honor of Halloween, Oh. <laughs> We'd give you a few stories, but one in particular about murders in which the perpetrators explicitly said that their murder or murders were infernally influenced. <laughs> yeah. All right. Like Kissel's need for beer is technically internally influenced. <laughs> uh -huh. 
Infernally at... influenced means we're talking about the fucking devil yeah. again. Uh, yeah. We're talking about the devil, though, but this is not suggestion of the devil's involvement in the crimes. We're talking is. about the devil has shown up in the form of, I'm not going to say the capital D devil like Anton LaVey knows. And they're talking about the, the allegorical devil. We're talking about Beelzebub and his legion of demons who come to Earth in order to create mayhem and McCallness. All right, there's no way that's not real. <laughs> <laughs> so murders blamed on demons or the devil, whether these murders are supernatural or not, are rare, but not quite as rare as you might think. Really? Not as rare as they should be. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, we've had a fairly recent mass shooting here in America in which the perpetrator said the devil was behind the whole thing. Hmm. And by the way, I totally forgot that this mass shooting even happened. Which one was it? Kalamazoo. Ah, the Kalamazoo. Okay. <laughs> the funniest named city one. Oh, great. <laughs> horrible, horrible. In February of 2016, an Uber driver named Jason Dalton shot and killed six people Jeez. in the span of about five hours in Kalamazoo, Michigan, opening fire at a Kia dealership, a Burger King, oh. and the parking lot of the local Cracker Barrel. This is horrible. This is why, if you got the Uber app, delete it, go to Lyft. <laughs> Always. Lyft is better. No, no. Lyft, they make you sit in the front seat and talk to you. They don't make and you sit in the out. front seat. No, no, I no, guarantee no. you, no Uber driver or Lyft driver looks at you and is like, hope he sits in the front. I guarantee you. They know entertainment's about to roll through. They know the circus <laughs> just got here. Um, but the... The lobby of a Cracker Barrel is where you're supposed to be safe. Yeah, that's a sanctuary. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, this is the parking lot of the Cracker Barrel. That's also a sanctuary. Yeah. It was, uh, I mean, what this guy did, he took a, a couple of guns. It was people that were in their cars, and he took guns on both sides and just started firing into the cars and killed four people Jeez. at the Cracker Barrel. Shit. That is, uh, they just wanted to go out for a nice mid middle-class dinner. Yeah. And this guy's a maniac out there. And the whole time this guy was doing this... He kept taking people on Uber rides, kept accepting fares. And people, like, they kept giving him that nervous, like, hey, you're not the killer, right? Uh, and he just said, no. Nothing is more convincing to the answer to the question of, ha, ha, well, you're not the killer, right? Than just a man staring forward going, no. <laughs> no. No, I'm not. Like Baby Driver or, uh, or Ryan Gosling in Drive. Yeah. Was was he now? How well did he do when it comes to? Because I remember this story now. I don't think he really was driving too well. Is uh, that correct? There was one person that said he uh, was driving erratically, and they jumped out of the car right. uh, because he was driving so erratically. But after that, he did the murder at the Keeler, Kia dealership, okay. and then kept taking fares. And all of those people had no complaints. Five stars. See? Five stars. Five stars. <laughs> with a tip. Five stars. And with a tip option, you're giving him two dollars extra just to help him get to his next murder point faster. <laughs> But you wow. got to keep that hustle flowing. <laughs> so after Dalton was caught, he claimed that on the day of his spree, the Uber app on his phone had become something different altogether. Ooh. He said in place of the button that said accept fair, there was now a pentagram. Oh, fuck yes. And every time Dalton pressed the accept button, the devil took over and forced him to kill. God, it's so crazy. So crazy. And by the end of that night, Dalton had fired 30 shots in three locations. And the answer to every question police asked him was simply that the devil had made him do it. I mean, it, it makes some sort of sense, like if you want to believe, because he did technically make him do it. it. Also, if we do want to believe that there is a massive New World Order plan going on, what a very interesting and intense metal way of uh, decreasing the surplus population well, I, by then sending evil Uber notices out. Very interesting thing about that. If you want to bring in the New World Order, mm -hmm. Dalton said that the pentagram was actually the Order of the Eastern Star, which is a Masonic symbol. All right. Well, oh, yes. I don't know if this is the NWO here. I don't think that it is. It's probably the Kalamazoo Taxi Organization. <laughs> it's the taxi union that is messing with the Uber apps. And, of course, this was great news for the taxi union. I don't think it is. It's the only <laughs> thing terrible news it's for the goddamn taxi union. I don't think this, is, think this is good news for anyone. The taxi, <laughs> taxi drivers have been maligned for so long. Robert taxi De Niro is a taxi thieves. driver. Taxi drivers are thieves and they'll do anything to fool you. No. They have had a negative reputation because of Mr. De Niro for thrice decades. 
and they deserve a little bit of respect. Very interesting, very interesting hills that you want to <laughs> die on. <laughs> so a year before Dalton's murder spree, some idiot in South Carolina who legally changed his name from John Lawson to Pazuzu Algarad. <laughs> Fuck yeah, dude, got to. Bro. So that's, if uh, you're, uh, that was Pazuzu, how do, how do you spell that exactly, sir? <laughs> P A Z Z U. Okay, well, Pazuzu. Sure. Well, Pazuzu claimed that an evil spirit had inhabited his body, and that evil spirit made him kill a harmless, widespread panic fan with his girlfriend Amber. You can't. Again, oh, to what? all hippies everywhere, never go to a second location. No. I know you're having fun right then, and then you just took the poppers, and so you got the head rush, and so you feel like nothing can go wrong, that the vibes of the panic are going to take you to nowhere but heaven, nowhere but places but you and your Birkenstocks can tap, dance, and do your weird wiggle, <laughs> white people cargo shorts dance that you do. Yeah. Um, but you will, and it will end up in your death. Yeah. That and, is sad. And Pazuzu did have white guy dreadlocks in one of his mug shots. Oh. Have you seen, well, one of the more famous things about Pazuzu Algarad was that they released the policed video tour of his home. Yeah. And if you watch it, I mean, he, uh, whether it is fantasy or not that he believed that he had been occupied by a demon, he definitely went to live the lifestyle. Yeah. And I kind of appreciate it almost, where it's like he wore all these weird satanic warnings all over the walls, a lot of swastikas, a lot of juggalo material, hmm. which is really not the juggalo's fault. No. No, we can't malign the juggalo here. Absolutely not. We're big juggalo supporters here at Last Podcast on the Left. You do you over, <laughs> over there. That's what I always say. Yeah, and Pazuzu, I mean, he took it, he took it really far. Like, he okay. filed his own teeth into points, he forked his own tongue, oh. he covered his face in a bunch of nonsensical ballpoint pen tattoos, and pretty okay. much, I mean, it looked like the type of shit that your buddies draw on your face when you pass out. Well, no, now he's becoming a fucking SoundCloud rapper. That's yeah. what's happening now, that's what's happening with the new generation. I heard that, always tired. Well, one neighbor testified to Pazuzu's quote-unquote possession, saying that they knew there was something wrong after they saw Pazuzu's sacrificing rabbits in his backyard. What about when he was coloring himself like he's a drunken Pollock? That was that was a part of it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, he was expressing himself. What about when he's filing <laughs> his teeth down? I will say, when someone starts filing their teeth down in front of you, a horrible thing to do on a plane, by the way. Yeah. Yes. You, know, you think it's very inappropriate. Just, very, very inappropriate. Very inappropriate. Just because of the sounds. Oh. Can you imagine oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I honestly, though, at the same time, if that's what you want to do, do that. I'm all about being fucking. Sure. If you want to look evil, look as evil as possible. But you don't have to. But I will say there's something. We'll, we'll get into this because we're going to talk more and more about possession as a topic. And there's something to me about the idea of it being 50-50. So if you're willing to walk the walk, if you're willing to really go all the way and from a magical standpoint, when you build a sort of shrine to a demon that you believe is occupying your mind, you're, in a way, you're making it real. In a way, you I are guess. making it real. But there are, you know, certain people who invite it in and using it use it as an excuse. In the case of Pazuzu, and other people where the answer is not quite so clear cut. Which we'll get to that guy later. Okay. Yeah. And uh, another neighbor also said that she knew something was wrong with Pazuzu when Pazuzu, uh, when she saw Pazuzu just take a big old shit on the floor of his own house. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah. So yeah. we got a uh, we got a shark tooth guy here covered in ink ah. taking dumps in his in his living room. Yeah, taking a big old dump right on the hardwood floor. Somewhere somewhere a producer at TLC got a spine tingle right down his back and was just like, <laughs> We've gotta go immediately. I found a perfect subject. <laughs> What I was really searching for in my new home was an open concept bathroom uh. where any room can be a bathroom. Because that's what the devil told me to do. Any room can be a bathroom if you really want it. <laughs> but these stories aren't just limited to America. In 2013, a 25 year old in Cumbria, England, Ooh. named John Jenkin, stripped naked and split open the skulls of both his mother and his sister with an axe. <laughs> fuck yeah shit holy fuck don't fuck yeah that it's not fuck yeah it's not nice it's not nice but i mean i it's well, not fuck yeah we have to i'm expressing we have to break myself. you of the habit of saying fuck yeah when people get murdered <laughs> i'm trying to in my daily life i have to i have to stop why doesn't the devil ever just help someone at Wendy's become a manager? <laughs> like it seems like the well, devil is a little bit he's, he's not really working in people's favor here 
When we talk about that, there are many types of possession. There is beneficiary possessions as well. If you look at PKD and his uh, experience with Vallis in Beyond the Occult by Colin Wilson, they describe that as a beneficiary possession because it told them about his son's illness. Uh, it helped him clean up his whole life. He did that kind of shit. That's happened again and again. And, People, and for the audience, it, PKD is Philip K. Dick. Yeah, I was about to clarify and as well. It, I had to go through my Henry... Like like little brain and just be like, what does PKD yeah, they, mean again? Go oh, through the Henry right. glossary and pull out PKD. Yeah, you understand. <laughs> You're learning. <laughs> well, this guy, John Jenkin, he told multiple people that he was going to kill someone and that Satan was behind it all. Mm. The night before he killed his mother and his sister, he reportedly told his friends, quote, I am the devil. And I need to confess. I don't know if he said it like that. I don't know how you <laughs> say that. How do you say it? I'm the devil. No, no, no. I'm going to confess. No, no, no. Uh, he was... I am. I am the devil. You know, I need to confess. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll get him right, right out and say it. I'll need to confess. What do you do if your friend says that to you? Well, I mean, you just laugh it off and keep on drinking. Uh, I guess. Uh, sure. Right. Cool. It's just. Cool. It's almost as scary as your friend being like, "I think I'm going to become an Uber driver." <laughs> No, it's the type of friends we know these people. It's like, you know, they become a butcher's apprentice. And sure. then all of a sudden, they're a woodsman apprentice. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, they're working at an adult jungle gym because that happens in Brooklyn. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, they're the devil and they need to confess. All right. <laughs> well, perhaps the most tragic of all of these was the case of Andrea Yates. Mm. In 2001, Yates drowned her five children in the bathtub of her Houston home yeah. and claimed that Satan was was to blame. This was a huge story. Gigantic yeah. story, yeah. She said that Satan had taken control of her soul, and since Satan was the dominating influence in her life, her children would naturally be infected. <sighs> and she believed that if she didn't do something drastic, her children would grow up to be serial killers and streetwalkers. Oh, my goodness. And since she nor anyone else would ever be able to get rid of Satan, in her mind, the only choice was to kill the children, which would do the double duty of saving them from a life of sin and misery and earning Andrea herself a devil-killing execution all in one fell swoop. Oh, my. It's not you. It's me. That's <laughs> that what just, this is all yeah. about. It comes all the way back to that. Andrew Yates, we're going to have to do a deeper dive on eventually um, because that story is very, very compelling. But there's something about that, too, because it's the missionary aspect of it yeah that happens in a lot of these cases especially um because we will bring it up again and again possession is a really uh interesting way to make yourself feel very important because oh uh, we uh we were talking last night uh, J jackie and i at halloween horror nights we were talking about uh gang stalking and we're talking about how scary gang stalking is but in the end it's like such an egotistical way to go insane because it's about Dozens of people came together just to fuck with you. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Where it's something like this, too, where possession brings all the eyeballs back mm -hmm. on mommy. When mommy's been taking care of these kids for so long, and then she believes something inside of her is turning them into demons, but they gotta go, not her. And by the way, we are being gang stalked by all the CCTV, CT, CCTV cameras Kiki everywhere. Kiki Putikis. <laughs> oh, we get the Kiki Putikis around got, here, and they feel when we go to bathroom. We know what's happening out there. We're being watched. Watched. Now, these cases, they really aren't all that hard to explain. I mean, Yates and Dalton are obviously mentally ill. Jenkins was mentally ill, plus he'd been abusing alcohol, acid, and weed, and Pazuzu was a schizophrenic with a terrible upbringing who wouldn't take his meds. Can we oh. say it was mostly the acid? <laughs> I don't think it was the BLs that really drove him over to become the devil. BLs, no. can, BLs can be a bad yeah, idea. They can. Yeah, BLs yeah, can anybody. definitely drive you to be yeah, the devil. Buddy. I'm playing Red Dead Redemption right now, You're and I gotta crazy. say, all the BLs do is make you be able to camp out when it's cold. <laughs> That's it's you. Not, it's also Nice that it's a video game. But. It's not true. Oh no! It's not like anyone who drinks BLs has uh, never uh, has never committed a heinous act. But my why father would you? used to go, and I would. I, could, I imagine my father did a solid baker's dozen of BLs a night, and then he'd come home and become an amateur interior designer and move the furniture around my house in a way that scared my family. The acid, I probably would have made my father scarier, but it's uh, it's intermittent. 
Yeah. yeah I half think an hour on, half an hour off. Your dad was taking some shots of whiskey. I'm not saying whiskey won't do it. Yeah, whiskey will also do it. But don't sit there and act like BLs, Bud Lights for the uninitiated. If you, uh, <laughs> yeah, bring, out your, your if you bring out your bin glossary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Bud Light, the only thing that will happen is you'll end up at a Buffalo Wild Wings having a great time watching a college team that's Division Two that you didn't even know you wanted to root for until you sit down and then you're really you, you support you're supporting the Wyoming Cowboys all of a sudden. Back to D. Well, the case in which we'll be spending the majority of our time on today is not quite as simple as all the ones that we just talked about, because today we'll be spending our time telling the story of Michael Taylor. Now, remember, possession has uh, been a part of the human experience for a really long time. Back to just the Oracle days, when the idea that we would take on a possessed state. That was a part of the idea of speaking in tongues, start like Ugh. talking to uh, a form of spirit guides, doing stuff like so. It's a it's an ancient part of our our existence, which is very interesting, and I don't know why. And we'll we'll go into further too when we get into exorcism mm-hmm. about how their pairing of possession and exorcism also became the first forms of psychotherapy, mm-hmm. which is it's Oof. very interesting to see go all the way back. The idea that at first they were equating everything to devils being in our bodies, and eventually they grew to saying, "Oh, these are mental illnesses," and now we're coming all the way back around to saying, "Yes, they are devils. They are here, and they must be exorcised." The only good side effect of all of that was the orgasm. <laughs> when doctors were just like, we're going to give you an orgasm, that should cure everything. This is true. Growing up, possessions were 100% real. Yeah. We used to watch borderline what seemed to be snuff films, but they were not. <laughs> uh, they were given to us by the church, and they were all grainy and stuff like that. Almost mm-hmm. like the autopsy footage that Fox showed that that one program. Yeah, the alien so autopsy. We used to believe that it was real growing up, which made The es- uh, Exorcist a hell of a documentary. Yeah, definitely. So 1974. 31-year-old Michael Taylor of Osset, West Yorkshire, England, committed a murder that was so ferocious and brutal that many believed that the only explanation was true demonic influence. Hmm. But that was mostly because Michael Taylor had just returned home from his own exorcism. And then the Curb Your Enthusiasm music comes in. (laughs) (laughs) This episode of Last Podcast on the Left is brought to you by Hunt a Killer. First there were the grisly murders, then came the strange clues, and the cryptic taunting letters, all from a psychopath who always manages to stay one step ahead of the authorities. It's your new favorite obsession, Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a monthly subscription where you become the detective immersed in a shocking murder mystery. Each month, a fictional serial killer will send you cryptic clues, objects, and letters that you can actually use to solve the crime in real time. It looks and feels so real, you'll start looking over your shoulder on the watch for the killer. Hunt a Killer is great to play solo or as a date night for your true crime-loving partner or join up with your friends to swap theories. Hunt a Killer has a huge online community so you can work with other people who are at the same point in the story as you. There are over 60,000 people chasing down the killer online and Hunt a Killer has over a thousand five-star customer reviews. And with Christmas coming up, this seems like the perfect gift for a last podcast on the left fan. Right now, just for our listeners, you can go to huntakiller.com slash last pod for 10% off your first box. They only accept 200 members per day, so hurry to take advantage of this offer. That's huntakiller.com slash last pod for 10% off your first box. Huntakiller.com slash last pod. See if you have what it takes to get into the mind of a serial killer and solve the mystery. But before we get into the story itself, let's acknowledge our main source today for the Michael Taylor story, The Sussex Devils by Mark Heal. And I got a lot of information from Beyond the Occult by Colin Wilson, which is another must-have book uh, for the student of the occult. Colin Wilson does such a good breakdown of sort of the psychic as undiscovered science activity version of possession. He has a couple of good chapters on possession in this book. Now, there are a ton of different versions of this story online and in various books, but it seems like Heel's version is the most consistent and reliable. Plus, dude used to play support for Gary Newman. Oh. So that's who we're going to go with today. Okay. He was the one to do the boom of the boom. 
Really? That's him. Honestly, me, Marcus, and our friend Sarah Richard are the only peoples I know that are direct, actual super fans of Gary Newman. <laughs> like, I am guy. a gigantic Gary Newman fan. Yeah? Yeah. Sure. It's, Why wouldn't you be? Yeah. I, I'm sure there's... Uh, also, uh, our friend Andy Org is also a gigantic we Gary Newman fan. We can name all four fans. <laughs> we could do this all episode long. <laughs> so, unlike most people who are involved in, a p- in possessions and exorcisms, Michael Taylor was not a particularly religious man prior to the events of fall 1974. Now, he did live in a highly religious town called Osset in Yorkshire, Mm -hmm. which Yorkshire is Pretty much, it's like England's version of the American South. Cool. Very agricultural, uh, very agricultural, very uh, religious. Uh, but neither Michael nor his wife nor their five children ever attended church, nor were they even quote unquote spiritual. But they were around it, and they were around right. the lifestyle of the church because it seems to be in England from what I understand it's kind of sort of similar Anglican is similar to sort of Lutheran where it's way more about like the hanging out than it is about the actual mass I'm not I'm speaking out of my ass but it seems <laughs> that I am I, I think that I from what I've read they always talk about normal and being yeah. proprietary and being being proper and shit Lutherans are pretty chill Protestants are intense yeah Catholics are somewhere in the middle I, Anglicans Catholics is are Protestants. fucking the, are the worst yeah. of the fucking yeah, Catholics bunch. are the most intense <laughs> no they're not as intense as the Protestants <laughs> what do you mean Protestant you mean like Baptists I'm and talking Methodists straight and... up people who don't do any of the wine is, is grape juice oh, oh yes like, so yes Catholics you're right. will they'll no. like have no Catholics Catholic uh, fish fries on Friday, for mm. example, everyone just gets hammered and eats a bunch of fish and thinks they're being pious. Catholic is a Catholic is a romantic slash terrifying version of Christianity because mm-hmm. you really are. It's the consummation of the flesh. It's him up there with the with the Magdalene shrouded yeah, in fucking is. like her gossamer webs. Jesus screaming as his side is pierced, and you have a man fumbling nervous because you're just the sweetest, precious little redheaded boy he's seen all day. <laughs> oh my goodness! Like it's a, it's, a, oh, it's a well, whole experience. I will say, great uh, if you want to go to a mass, the Stations of the Cross. Mass is actually pretty fun. It's horrified. Yeah. Uh, so it's a good t- it's a good story. Well, Michael Taylor was actually said to be the very definition of mild mannered. Pretty much just like boring, quiet British dad and a loving marriage, raising five kids and a little poodle. But that's not to say that Michael didn't have problems. Everybody's got problems. Of course. Yeah. See, England in the 70s was a pretty piss poor place to live because a lot of the country was out of work. There was a huge economic depression. Mm. And even some of the people who did have jobs, they could only work. They actually like reduced it, made a law that you had to have a three day work week. Hmm. And because of chronic back pain, Michael, who was a butcher by trade, had an even harder time finding work than most. And because he had a hard time finding work and because his back was constantly killing him, Michael was prone to bouts of depression. That'll I'll happen. see you, maybe. Or maybe your wife for me fix your beer with pig in it. Is that oh there, all right, my wife? I want you to hold up this pig side. I'm going to lay in my back right here on the couch and I'll tack it upwards. I'll tack it upwards with my cleave. I take it. Oh, I'm getting blood all over my. Side. Oh, I'm getting blood all over me, all over the. Oh, yeah, you don't want to be a butcher <laughs> from the bottom. <laughs> no, that is that's not good. But that back pain really does cause depression. Shawn Michaels. That's why he had to retire. Back pain, and he said he lost his smile. Yeah, that was sad. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He said he lost his smile. God, I fucking. I just have this horrifying vision of Shawn Michaels with the mouth like from the Twilight Zone movie, where there's no. It's just Ooh. flesh color. With no lips, Honestly. and it's him like searching for his smile in a bunch of bushes. <laughs> the ladies would still love him. By the way, Roman Reigns has leukemia. It came back, so we're thinking about your Roman. Thinking about your Roman. Okay. Well, Michael Taylor's depression was noticed by a neighbor named Barbara Wardman, and Wardman figured of that the of course it was. Yeah. <laughs> you know Barbara Wardman; she knows everybody in that entire block. She knows when they're breathing. I couldn't what- help but have listened to every single thing your family's ever said through your very paper thin walls. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you exactly what you need, and it's the power of Christ. Oh, yep, my. that's what she said. She said they need a good old fashioned helping of Jesus H. Christ, and okay. that. 
pick them right up out of the doldrums. Ugh. But she also knew that the Taylors found church to be a little uncomfortable, while with all the rituals and such. Because mm. the Anglican church, like, it's an off... I mean, it was a, kind of a split from the Catholic church, so they do have somewhat of the pomp and circumstance, just not as much. Okay. They don't have confession and all that. They like cake. They- <laughs> Ooh. But Barbara had what she thought was a clever little back door to satisfying spirituality. <laughs> oh, yikes. That sounds Catholic to me. <laughs> anyway, that's all inside there joke always there. Is. There always is a little loophole as a way to get that uh, spirituality in there in a different way. Uh-huh. Well, Barbara had just begun to attend a small Christian fellowship group that was meeting in homes around Osset, and, fi- and she figured that this was just the thing to lift Michael Taylor out of his depression. Okay. Now, this group did not have an official name, but had Michael Taylor not done what he eventually did, it is possible that this group could have blossomed into a full-grown cult by the end of the decade. Really? This is why if you were a potential cult leader, and I do believe this, it's why they start small and you do the frog and the the water bit where you slowly turn up the temperature. You can't have somebody in there who's spotlight hungry from the very beginning because yeah. they'll ruin the whole build. Right, mm-hmm. absolutely not. Well, the reason why this could have turned into a full-grown cult was because it was led by a magnetic 21-year-old blonde named Marie Robinson, hmm. who supposedly had the healing touch and was gaining followers of all ages at an alarming rate. Now, lady cult leaders, they are out there, man. Yeah. What do you think are the main differences between a female cult leader and a male cult leader? It doesn't seem like they have the same sort of final conclusion or final solution for an end. Absolutely See? not. See, that's the thing. What a lot of people don't realize is that female cult leaders like female female serial killers are much more successful than their male counterparts, Scientology being the obvious exception. Mm. But the reason why the ladies take it to the next level is the reason why female serial killers don't get caught. It's all under the radio radar and it's much more subtle okay and because of this female-led cults have a much better chance of ending in vast riches rather than wide-scale deaths. That's what you they want. They become goop. They learn how to flip it into a website, a lifestyle website. <laughs> right. it, like Nexium was kind of the same way. Without Nexium would not have reached the the amount of time it existed without the women that were in charge of that group. But I think the fall was because of Rainier himself. Mm-hmm. The man Again, it's always the fucking dudes because we don't we have no impulse control. Where it's like a, a Marie Robinson, she knows exactly the gentle way. Mm-hmm. She can talk everybody into the loving arms of Christ. With a little touch of the knee, a little <laughs> peck of the lip, a little bit of a petite four. That's what the, that's what they like. They're little tiny little tea cakes, and she's sweet as a pie. Yeah, I don't like you doing that accident with that mustache. That is that is confusing. <laughs> me. Oh yikes! Well, for an example of a female cult leader. Okay. Michael Taylor's leader, Marie Robinson, was a direct spiritual descendant of Amy Semple McPherson, Hmm. who founded the Four Square Church here in America back in the 20s. Okay. Four Square services are highly theatrical and participatory. Checking in! (laughs) Yep. Focusing on speaking in tongues and faith healing. It's pretty much an offshoot of the Pentecostal church, but with one important distinction. Amy McPherson was in charge, and at the height of her fame, she was just as well known in America as Babe Ruth. Really? Yeah, and she would also make the same rounds with Babe Ruth to the children's hospital, give them old nips of whiskey so that they could sleep better. (laughs) Yeah, that probably would have helped him back then. This this whole faith healing thing, we used to go to the church that did all the faith healing. People had real problems like MS and stuff, and it never worked, but they kept on going back, so they should have gone to the doctor, I think. I mean, Amy and her followers, they were so successful throughout the decades that I could drive less than 10 miles north, south, east, or west from the house where I grew up, and I'd hit a small town with the four square church really oh yeah rochester had one weiner had one haskell had one knock city had one monday monday had one monday and monday. Weiner had one. henry can you believe that All monday, way to monday. <laughs> monday and weiner both had four square churches can you believe that yeah. weiner got the church but, huh? and that's a, and the amazing thing is like weiner had less than 200 people and they still had a four square church it's just so sad that your town didn't no because, rochester did oh rochester yeah, did. i just didn't i didn't grow up in town i grew up seven miles outside of town okay yeah yeah, yeah. and that's like 
like, you know, Weinert was one way, Rochester was another way, Knox City was over there, Haskell was over there. And uh, by the way, we have uh, a listener out in Mundy. So, uh, hey, how you doing? Oh, hey, how, hey, how are you doing, <laughs> our single listener in Mundy? Mundy. How's the, how is the come and go? <laughs> Mundy. It's spelled with, it's Monday, but it's spelled with a U, and it's pronounced Mundy. I hate Mundy's. <laughs> Maybe they have that for a t-shirt I remember. or something. I don't know. They don't. They don't have okay. any t-shirts kinda, that are specific. Well, it could be kind of That fun. would be great. That's how yeah. you bump up the name. You gotta bump it up. No, but then that's the thing is that you gotta get the town that's the rival of Mundy to say, I hate Mundy's. Uh, yeah. yeah. The Thursday. flumpers. Yeah, you get the gory to do that. Yeah, yeah. sure. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Uh, even though it seems a little ridiculous to imagine British people speaking in tongues, I think it's possible that Marie Robinson could have accomplished something similar to Amy McPherson had it not been for the road bump of Michael Taylor. Okay. I do declare... Uh, rimple, rumple, uh, more, uh, more snick a daggy. No, uh, I, oh, oh, this is simply embarrassing. <laughs> All I could think of was just rambi, pambi, dambi, rambi, rambi, dambi, rambi, bambi, rambi, tambi. This is the last no, acceptable know. racism right. that can exist. <laughs> Either way. In 1974, the few people that Marie had gathered were already all in behind her, and the Taylors were primed to join the flock. See, unlike the stuffy Anglican church that the Taylors had already rejected, this group, they all smiled and they laughed and they talked throughout their meetings. You know, they, they practiced the kind of Christianity that makes you feel good. It's, it's cool church. It's cool church, yeah. And especially when, yeah, because... Uh, uh, actually, I hate uh, fucking cool church. Yeah. I hate it oh, no. so much. For a prime example of that, uh, what's her name? Marie uh, Anderson. She regularly described herself as just another Jesus freak. Uh-oh. Oh, yeah. Let's Listen but I can DC see talk. how it gets gets people in. You yeah, go sure. through it stuffy. Michael's an older man. He's looking for a new lease on life. He's been he's kind of half the dude that he remembered himself being because of the pain he's constantly in. And he walked into this place, and it's like sunshine. Mm -hmm. yes. And at the center of it is Marie. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe then... sometimes Marie doesn't wear a bra because <laughs> she's just kind of natural. Like well, you don't know. She's she, she loves a tambourine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's the thing. And then kids growing up, when they they can rebel by going to cool church, mm -hmm. but then they're still going to church. So their exactly. parents are still happy. And that's the thing, man, is that by the end of Michael and Christine's first visit, Michael was already speaking in tongues with the best of them. Oh. One visit. Now, one version that I read about this visit on the internet concerning that night said that Marie Robinson called upon the congregation to see if anyone needed healing. Ooh. Uh, as we said, Michael suffered from debilitating back pain, so he volunteered. He figured, fuck it, let's give it a shot. And yeah, he, man, fucking fool, let's rip that band-aid off yeah. right here. It's like, yeah, let's give it a give it a go. Let's sure. rip it off. Let's see, let's right. see what happens here. And Jump so in. he started walking to the front. And Marie, she started walking towards Michael, but she stopped instead at an old lady named Mavis Smith, who was just sitting there weeping in her seat. <laughs> picture her eating crumb cakes and stuff. That, that's not appropriate. <laughs> so Marie stopped, knelt, and started speaking in tongues at Mavis because that was part. That was part of her healing rituals. <laughs> <laughs> then, to everyone's surprise, Michael Taylor dropped to his knees out of nowhere and started doing the same. Whoa. Yeah, so they're both talking in tongues with this old lady who's just sitting there crying and crying. Yikes. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that sounds fun. And even though not a goddamn thing was done about Michael's back pain, by the time he and his wife left at the end of the night, they had become total converts. And pretty soon, they were hosting the fellowship meetings in their own home. Uh, I'm sure their children were so happy when they came back. Mm. Totally different. Absolutely. Because you know when your parents get new friends? Mm. It's like my mom's in the middle. She found a new spiritual group. And they always come around. And it's always just this. Because my mom gets, well, like, we'll find a new spiritual group. And then when they come in, they're always just like, it's so wonderful. Your energy is exactly <laughs> as I imagined it. Yeah. And then they, like, touch my face, they touch my elbows, and you're like, great, all right, so this th th this next year we'll get the new group, but it'll be the same thing. They're like, you are just a fountain of light. Yeah, I like, don't think they've you. met you. 
<laughs> but now, honestly, though, you have been maligning your parents for a long time. We got to meet them at the wedding. Wonderful. They were just delightful people. Wonderful. Yeah, and that's how it always is. No, they were your great. Your father had I love my parents. They did a really good energy. job. He but, really had an energy. Your father was great. He told me a great story yeah. about his hat blowing off uh, in the middle of the winter. And he that's told you the hat story. He told me the hat story. I got the hat story, too. Yeah, that's why he moved away from New York. You never told us the father's hat story. <laughs> because it's his story. Okay. He, um, but I actually wanted to ask you a serious question, Kessel. So you came from the same environment. Yeah. When people were speaking in tongues, like you've kind of, we've joked about this in the past, but like when you're watching a whole room of people snap into it, how, like, did you really want to like join in? You, like, is it a thing you watch it where you see it go, all these people pop off and you're like, I want to be a part of this energy? For some reason, I always had in my head, people love to lean in and yeah. they wanted to be part of the congregation. So we're talking, our church was about 200, 250 people, pretty healthy size for the small town that I grew up in. So they, you could see people just slowly fall and roll in with it because you get all the positive reinforcement. I got kicked out of uh, Sunday school because I wouldn't speak in tongues mm-hmm. because quite frankly, I wasn't good at improv. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> And so it was always like really it, it taught me a lot about the cult of personality and how much uh, I would, you can get people to do anything. It's the power of suggestibility. Power of suggestion. Yeah, I mean, I so, went to a, I went to I one. Mean, watching my, I will say this: watching my dad do it with his like he's still kind of a German accent. It was just I, I was like, Dad, I can say it's just I can I can he's just, yeah, he's just like, yelling in German. Yeah, I was like, you're 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 more rational than this, but they they leaned in too. They still do it. Yeah, I mean, I went to a, a Foursquare service when uh, I was in high school. Me and my buddy Josh went, uh, and it freaked us out because it's, it was like a, it was a youth centric service. They invited yes. like all the kids to, to come. It was the middle of the summer, and you know, and this old woman, the uh, the Foursquare uh, priestess, uh, she was laying her hands on people we'd known our entire lives. Yeah. We and just knew them as just regular people. All of a sudden, these kids they're crying, they're shaking, they're flopping around on the fucking floor. And me and my buddy Josh just look at each other and go, "We need to." leave now well i was always i always felt very reassured because when my friends would sleep over on saturday we'd go to church on sunday and they would all look at me like what the fuck and i'm like this is what i've been saying <laughs> it's so creepy dude but yeah I, I told marcus this story before the show i went to get my hand to get uh, my head the, to do the lay on hands thing yeah for god knows what i was like maybe 11 years old the pastor just pushed me over, and I fall down. The people catch you, and I open my eyes. Everyone else has their eyes closed, and they're shaking, and I'm looking right up this girl's skirt. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah, like, I what love the this. Hell is-? So I immediately shut my eyes again. I was like, what is What is this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because imagine her look down as you just going, hi, no, was- with like thumbs up. You know, like, <laughs> it changes church well, for everyone. We did look you at see, each other. Um- I was just like, what? And she's like, well, I don't know. Like, we were- <laughs> <laughs> the Catholic Church works on silence. Yes. Yeah. And kneeling. Yeah, yeah. And also the the Baptist church that I went to, for the regular Baptist church, that also worked on mostly silence. Like and that. silence and sleep. Shh. A lot of... <laughs> <laughs> but the Methodist church that we ended up going to when I was in high school was quite wonderful. Okay. But yeah. you could see how Michael Taylor, like, this was very intoxicating. Yeah. Right. Like, you walk into this thing, this is just the... This is Sister Act 2. Yeah. You Ooh. walk into that church and all of a sudden there, you're like, you got zip in your step and you're got a new group of people and marie's looking better and better every week and she's paying a lot more attention to you each week as every, every minute you spend with her yeah. it's like you're the only one she cares about yeah because marie just like amy mcpherson was pretty cute okay. i mean she wasn't hot but you know she was cute but unlike amy marie had an element of danger that made her sexy as well oh See, one thing that's somewhat obvious to me about Marie Robinson is that spirituality and power over others turned her on. Oh, my God. She is sitting on a full tea kettle up there <laughs> watching them <laughs> did fall down on their knees. She's just full of soup. Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. But it wasn't the peace and love part of Christianity that made Marie hot. Marie liked to court the dark side. Ooh. And she was a big fan of attending exorcisms, okay. which weren't quite as rare as you might think, considering how they were all in a highly religious town in a time of economic depression. Sure. Now, we're not talking Catholic exorcisms here. These were Protestant exorcisms, specifically Anglican, meaning they were done under the umbrella of the Church of England. Which normally a bound 
possessed person is on a bed, and then they leave scones <laughs> at the oh, other yeah. end of the bed so that the demon comes at me because they a no English person can resist a scone. Oh, absolutely not. Now, if you're in the middle of an exorcism and it's time for tea, mm-hmm. do you break? Uh, we're going to answer that question later. Great. <laughs> <laughs> However, Protestants don't like to call it exorcism. They prefer the word deliverance, as in deliver us from evil, because it kind of softens the blow of the whole operation, makes it a little less scary, a little less weird. Yeah. But the whole point is for that it is scary and yeah. it's fun. Just, whatever, well, you know, whatever. It's, they don't understand packaging. Like, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> from what I can tell, though, the only differences between the two is that Catholics use Latin and throw holy water from afar, while the Protestants prefer using English and uh, prefer the laying of hands. And now, uh, Cool Church actually uses super soakers, yeah. <laughs> which is true. Kind of fun. When I ended up watching a bunch of Bob Larson exor- uh, oh, exorcisms oh, again, and his his method is the man is screaming, being held, and then you just slap him on the forehead yeah. with the yeah. Bible. Yeah. yeah, he, Benny Hinn, they just beat up people. Yeah. It was horrible. Well, for those of you who don't know, the practice of hand laying is exactly what it sounds like. A person with the healing touch will lay their hands on the afflicted, thereby channeling the spirit of Jesus Christ into the person in question, thereby healing them. And that is a basis in scripture, because that's what Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ went in some of one of the all of the first stories of a part of the, his his ministry was exercising demons from people, and he'd go and stick his thumbs on their eyes and like play with their <laughs> mouth and shit. And they go, ah, ah, ah. and he's like, "I'm fixing you. I'm fixing you, bro." Well, it seemed to work, I guess. <laughs> well, the Anglicans, much like the Catholics, have a full set of guidelines for performing their version of exorcism, which those guidelines. Not so coincidentally, meticulously updated in 1975 in the year following the Michael Taylor exorcism. They did an update, huh? They did a bit of an update. Interesting. Yeah, it needed a, it needed a spruce up after <laughs> right. what happened. On well, these guidelines, it stated, among other things, that no exorcisms should be done alone, clear lines of accountability should be drawn at all times, and everyone involved must be covered by adequate insurance. It's like what should be done when you audition for a movie now. <laughs> yes. So God basically just ter- changed the terms and agree- uh, yeah. the terms of agreement. Yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Well, according to an interview with a modern English deliverance minister done by the Telegraph in 2015, anyone who wants to perform an exorcism these days has to attend a four-day-long compulsory training course. God, I want to go so bad. That's four days of talking about the devil. Yeah. And then lunch is fun because you're mixing with all these people and you're talking about the devil and you're being like, how many times have you seen the devil? And it's like, I've seen the devil four times. I mean, like... Cool, man. Cool. <laughs> yeah, what, Salisbury steak's good. <laughs> what <do> you, oh. <laughs> well, they say that the main focus of this seminar is to tell if the person in question is properly possessed or just mentally ill. And they say they can differentiate between the two by making sure the possessed in question checks off three boxes. The person must demonstrate superhuman strength. They oh, yeah. must have a knowledge of a language unknown to them prior to the possession. And they must have knowledge that was gained through supernatural means, as oh. in they know personal facts about the people in the room that should be impossible for them to know. Okay. All of these are cool abilities yep. if it also didn't involve you masturbating with a crucifix in front of your parents. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Interesting. Now, the act of deliverance, according to the Anglican Church, is only supposed to be done after the case has been examined and approved by a bishop. But it seems like in Osset, West Yorkshire, in 1974, nobody was playing by the rules. Oh, my no, gosh. No, it was real fast and loose. Yeah. So they did it amateur style. Okay. This was like an open mic of an exorcism. And I think a lot of it had to do with they think that Marie just felt she had the touch. She could do it. And yeah. Right. So, yeah. so this is like when the UFC first began and they're like, there's no weight classes. How do you win? Punch him in the balls. Punch him in the balls. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Punch him in the balls. Yes. So that's the kind of phase that they're in right now. Pretty much, okay. yeah. It's not too long before Michael Taylor fell off the deep end, the fellowship group attempted a non-sanctioned exorcism in Michael and Christine's home, Led by Marie Robinson. I'd watch the pay-per-view. <laughs> I would watch that. Oh, yes. <laughs> the non-sanctioned. That sounds really cool. Yeah. So Mavis Smith, the same woman whom Michael had spoken in tongues towards on his first night, she'd fallen deeper 
into depression. Oh. So one night, as she told everyone in the group about the shit she was going through, Marie decided to perform an impromptu exorcism right there in the Taylor's living room. Whoa. Well, how about this? How about this for you? You want me to flip your wig here? We could do the exorcism right now. What? What did I just say? <laughs> You're like, no <laughs> shit! No oh, shit! Oh, 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 We're gonna do the exorcism <laughs> right fucking now! That's crazy. <laughs> oh shit! You <laughs> can't just spring that on people like that. <laughs> Needless to say, things did not work out well. Aw. Marie approached the old woman by yelling at her in tongues and laying her hands. And Mavis, yep, she totally played her part. She was doing all the violent thrashing. She was growling, doing everything that was expected of her. But finally, though, they just call the whole thing off. They just called they, it they, off? They're just like, it's a, they're like, this isn't working. Let's call it a wash. And from what I can tell, Mavis Smith was pretty much just left to suffer while the fellowship group just moved on to something oh, else. You can't just, uh, I've still got a dog demon in me. I'm still half a dog. <laughs> Poor Mavis, half a dog Mavis. Here we go, listen. I know, I know you still have a dog and you're very upset about it, but here's a five- Dollar discount coupon to Maccas. Go get yourself a burger. <laughs> That's actually very nice. This episode of Last Podcast on the Left is brought to you by Casper. Casper is a sleep brand that continues to revolutionize its line of products to create an exceptionally comfortable sleep experience one night at a time. Casper mattresses are designed by humans for humans and are made right here in the USA. The original Casper mattress fuses multiple supportive memory foams for a terrific sleep surface with that perfect sink and just the right bounce. The Casper has a breathable design that helps you sleep cool and comfy and it even helps regulate your body temperature all night long. And they don't have just mattresses. Casper has a ton of products to ensure you get the best sleep of your life. Buying the Casper mattress couldn't be easier. You order Order online and it's delivered right to your door in a compact box with free shipping and free returns to the U.S. and Canada. And by going to casper.com slash L-E-F-T and using the promo code L-E-F-T at checkout, you'll even get $50 towards select mattresses. Considering we spend one third of our lives on a mattress, it's so important to truly sleep on a mattress before committing. That's why Casper gives you 100 nights to try it out. You know, actually, hell, I didn't even need the 100 nights because I knew as soon as I slept on the Casper mattress, I wouldn't be sleeping on anything else. I got a Casper mattress. Henry's got a Casper mattress. Ben's got a Casper mattress. And we all absolutely love them. So get $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash left and using the promo code left at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. That's $50 towards select mattresses by visiting casper.com slash left and using promo code left at checkout. See, later on, it was said in the inquest into the murder that the reason why this group was ultimately so dangerous was because they were neurotics feeding neuroses to other neurotics, making whatever underlying mental problems that these people might have had just that much worse. Yikes. However... What is interesting about exorcism is that had these people known what they were doing or if they had any training whatsoever in the field of mental health, this might have actually helped. See, some people with mental disorders actually respond quite well to exorcisms done over weeks or months if they believe in it, hmm. just like people respond to psychotherapy in much the same way. Repeated It's an visits. interesting phenomenon, but that means sure. it puts the onus on the therapists and shit like that, that if you have a really, really intense Christian or someone who's a religious person who does believe they're being occupied with a demon, sometimes it really helps to just exercise them and give them what they want. Sure. Yeah, I mean, All right. yeah, the difference is that in psychotherapy, you talk to a licensed therapist once a week for about an hour, you know, about your feelings, your thoughts, your emotions, while an exorcism, yeah. you scream and you gnash your teeth while a priest fucking yells at you. My, th this guy that I talk to every now and again, he keeps on trying, he's mining, he's mining me. Mining? Yeah. He's mining, he's asking questions. Uh, yeah, it's I called said, a leave it alone. Yeah, it's called, it's called you paid to go see a therapist. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know what That's he's what trying that to is. do. Yeah, well, but mining you for what? Information about for what purpose? Why am I the way that I am? <laughs> now I'm talking yeah, dude, about it's not a police care. interrogation. It's, it's, it's just it's your an therapist. interrogation. <laughs> just give me my but, medication, please, sir. Well, while what therapy sounds reasonable, okay, and exorcism sounds crazy, all right, it might just be a case of different strokes for different folks. 
One paper published in Psychology Today actually argued that if a person truly believes that they are possessed, and we're talking about the person who is possessed believes they're possessed. We're not saying that the people on the out, like parents believing that their you know children are possessed by mm-hmm. a gay demon. We're not talking about right, that type right. of situation. We're talking those about, are the fun demons. Yeah, yeah, honestly, that would be really nice to just have that happen to me once. <laughs> well, just once in my life, it would be nice to be possessed by a gay demon. That's okay. <laughs> well, we're talking about people who truly believe that they themselves are possessed by demons. This paper suggested that there might not be anything wrong with using their belief system as an aid for treatment. Hmm. Essentially using exorcism as a placebo. Interesting. But Marie Robinson was not a trained professional. See, just like with psychotherapy, if you don't know what you're doing, you can easily make things far worse than if you just left it alone. I see. And this is where possession is a community story. It's something about the vibe she's setting up that I think that's either it's either one or the other. Like you could say she's perpetuating something that's fake, which is if you want to immediately say that, sure. Or you can say she's fostering an environment where where they talk about a possession. It's a lot of times if it were going to happen, it would happen when someone's at a weak point. It would happen when someone is at uh, either a physical weak point or. Uh, spiritual slash mental weak point, mm-hmm. depressed, doing stuff where essentially you you have eased up the borders, your psychic borders, to something that could come in and fuck with your mind. You're looking for any kind of help you can get. Yeah, and we're not necessarily saying that, you know, when you loosen up those psychic borders, we're not necessarily talking about the Christian devil uh, or anything like that. We're not necessarily talking about religious devil. You know, we're, I mean, we have some uh, interesting conversations on the collective unconsciousness, I would say. Sure. Uh, Daemonic. The the concept of demonic possession, mm -hmm. which is the idea, which is a thing that started with, I believe, the shadow world that Jung was talking about, the This concept that maybe there are, if there are intelligences that come much like ghosts, because when you read about ghost activity, Beyond the Occult does a good breakdown of it. It's very, again, similar to alien abductions. You get paralyzed. You you get, you can sometimes move to another (laughs) space. You could do all this stuff. You have the same kind of weird physical reactions that maybe there's something that's like a daemonic, which is D-A-I-M-O- and I see, I believe, or D A E. I don't know. It's D-A- I don't D-A- know. D A E M O N I C. Eleven-year-old Henry Zabrowski. That was not the question we asked here at the National Spelling Bee. Um, the, the word is Give me apple my tree. Pizza. <laughs> okay, it's apple tree. <laughs> so, but a part of it is that the idea that they, it's not just a Judeo-Christian. Uh, version of possession no. that there are other intelligences that can jump in and a part of it it's like maybe it's a version of borderline personalities or maybe it's something else maybe it's different fractions of our mind that essentially are so different from our main consciousness that they are like other intelligences yeah. it's all it gets very complicated yeah and it could be that you know mm. exert or possession or something like that is uh, something breaks in a person's mind something comes in from the collective unconscious and that's why people can suddenly speak languages that Ooh. they've never heard before right. uh, and it essentially something breaks in their mind and it's too much they get too much in and of course there's no scientific basis behind that but you know what i'll always say it fun to think about fun to think about about. those are definitely words (laughs) we know that we know that well marie she was just kind of making up all this shit as she went along and she was playing with forces that were far more dangerous than she realized and i'm not even talking about supernatural forces i'm just talking about human beings Mm -hmm. but it wouldn't be long before marie would find out firsthand just what she was fucking with here. Uh Uh-oh. Now, after the failed exorcism, some of the shine of the fellowship group starting to wear off for Christine Taylor. That's Michael Taylor's wife. Because the whole experience freaked her out enough to snap her out of the good-feeling wave that had swept up both her and her husband. She's got to get a W here. She's got to channel her inner Aaron Rodgers, tell everyone to relax, and got to start winning. Mm Mm-hmm. And that may be why Christine started to notice that her husband was much more interested in Marie Robinson than Jesus Christ. Uh Uh-oh. And it seemed like Marie was doing her best to encourage it. This is much worse than a demonic possession, having your wife speculate that you like somebody more than her. (laughs) I would rather be possessed by every single demon in the history of demons. (laughs) Well, Christine walked in more than once to find her husband, who had been nothing but loving and faithful throughout their marriage prior to this meeting. Uh Uh-oh. She'd find him with his hands on Christine's shoulders and his eyes fixed solely on Marie, saying this was all under the guise of, quote-unquote, 
prayer. I don't yeah. know prayer, about yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Then oh, yeah. Michael and Marie started meeting up for private rituals in which they'd stay up all night together just making the sign of the cross at each other because they were convinced that the full moon would bring evil every time it hung in the sky. Hmm. So they needed to protect each other from that. Okay, her concerns are... i tell you them. something, Marie. I, these nights have been so special with you, and I... I know the moon is evil. Yes, the moon is evil. But you ever look up at the moon and think that that moon, it looks like one half of a great big giant But <laughs> Yes, I do. <laughs> Kiss me under the milky twilight, lean me. And they're just holding each other's hands and they go, fuck the devil, fuck the devil, <laughs> fuck the devil. <laughs> well, it's kind of romantic there. Oh, yeah. Well, pretty much everyone in the group was well aware of the sexual tension between Michael and Marie. Well, now, how oh, is Michael yeah. going to pull? He's a, he's a father of, what, five? Five, yeah. And so yeah, he's yeah but he's not this... dead, man. Yeah. Just because he's a father no, with I kids doesn't that, mean he doesn't a, feel yeah. these passions. Yeah, she doesn't mean 21... he, just because he has five children doesn't mean he can't abandon them. No, I understand. <laughs> I understand that, uh, but this is a 21-year-old aspiring cult leader. This guy's got to be what in his 40s. At you know, this he's point? 31. 31. He's years not that old. much older than her. All right, was he? I mean, I don't. I don't. He, he I was he one of, a little out of his league. He yeah. looks like uh, he kind of looked like uh, Major Briggs from yeah. Twin Peaks. Sure. Uh, he was one of those 31-year-old guys that looks like he's 45. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's that'll do it. You mean cool guy. <laughs> cool guy? Yeah, cool guy. <laughs> well, yeah. Pretty much everyone in the group was well aware of the sexual tension between Michael and Marie, but Michael. He just kind of brushed it off. He'd often say to the group in front of his wife that he loved Marie with a Christian love, a love that could hurt no one. Ugh, that means you, you yeah. have sex Ugh. while someone splashes a, just buckets of blood like your carry on top of you. <laughs> I could just see a priest doing that with the <laughs> altar boy again to be like... This is a Christian love. Yeah, it's disgusting. Uh, meanwhile, Michael was withdrawing from his family completely. He was acting irritable. He was lashing out at tiny shit, and he was spending more and more time alone. Hmm. So one night, Christine decided that she'd had enough. Yeah. And she called out both Marie and her husband at a fellowship meeting being held at the family home. Honestly. Oh, shit. Oh, yeah. dear. Oh, this is the know. best right. fellowship group I have ever been fucking a part of, guys. There this is, is fucking sweet. There is definitely like a couple looking at each other, being like, "This is getting good. This, this, this is oh, this is finally." I told you we should keep coming. Yeah, yeah, this is great. Now, some say that Christine straight out accused Michael and Marie of infidelity, but. I think Mark Heal's version of events is probably closer to the truth, if only because it is much more awkward and much more human than a dramatic accusation. Okay. So after Christine brought up the up till then unspoken sexual tension in front of the whole group, she suggested that Michael and Marie should go alone in a room upstairs with everyone else waiting outside and they should resolve what was going on between them once and for all. Well, that's not so, a good solution. <laughs> that you just straight up, because you can see Michael just being like, oh, you serious? Mm. So we go upstairs, alone, me and Marie here, alone, yeah, the both of us, <laughs> and we resolve our sexual tension upstairs. Yeah, seems like a right fine idea. I don't know. <laughs> That's a trick. This turned out to be another bad idea. Yeah. According to Marie, as soon as the door was closed, Michael went in for a kiss. Oh. See, Michael, oh. he most likely thought that this was the beginning of a sexy new life with uh -oh. a blonde 10 years younger than him, and he'd be able to leave his boring, unemployed with five kids life behind him mm. oh but that wasn't the game that marie was playing really Definitely yeah. not. <laughs> what? see she understood that sex appeal was an important part of what she was doing but the point of her little cult unlike cults led by males was not sex Ooh, yeah yeah marie only wanted power or at least that's what it seems like so when michael made his move she gently let him down and told him you should go back to your wife. Oh, oh but oh, listen, sixpence done the richer. <laughs> I thought that it was going to be you and me forever living on a lily pad. Oh, I wanted to live on a lily God. pad with you. Now, at first, uh, Michael accepted, and you know, and they hashed it out for a few more minutes, uh, oh, and Michael. then, 
And then the two of them, like, they asked both Christina, the rest of the congregation, like, come on upstairs, come on, we figured it out. Uh, but instead of just kind of downplaying this extremely embarrassing situation, right. where he, like, he could have come out and said, like, yeah, you know, we talked, and, you know, we, yeah, we, we kind of see what you guys are saying, so, you know, we're just going to... I realize that I, this is entirely inappropriate, yes, and I, I have a family, and yeah, she's, a, I, I she's really, my church leader. Yes, His exactly. reaction should have been like... You know, that makes sense. Got yeah. you know, I got that. Okay, that works. Yeah, but instead of that, Michael blew it out. He came out and he said, a miracle has happened. Uh-oh. We have both overcome our passions. <laughs> and, of course, everybody was like, uh, I the don't mir- know so if that's what happened. He's up there. Oh, he's second. just being uh, like, and what's important to remember is if you give up love to Jesus Christ, if you give it up to him, he will fix it and make sure you ain't horny for your priest anymore. <laughs> You're just out here. You think, meanwhile, he's got like a full like boner in his jeans. <laughs> we don't know That's if he it, had it, a boner it, in his jeans. Well, we don't knows? know. Who knows? <laughs> but so his miracle, or what this miracle was supposedly, is that a 21-year-old was no longer attracted to a 31-year-old father of five who had a wife. <laughs> That's the miracle? That was that was the miracle that they had both overcome That's their the passions. the easiest miracle yeah. God has ever had to pull off. Yeah. <laughs> If you lower the bars for miracles, yeah. it's just yeah. like, oh, wow, what a miracle. I got three sips left of my LaCroix. It's amazing. <laughs> God is real. Wow. Yeah. And no one bought it. Uh, but as the mood just started to kind of settle into a quiet awkwardness, something changed in Michael Taylor. Uh-oh. Now, suddenly, the mild-mannered family man who had developed an unwanted crush on his fellowship leader just kind of left. And what replaced him, as Marie later described to the police, was something bestial and inhuman. Upon seeing the sudden change in Michael's eyes, Marie fell back on her old standby and just started screaming at him in tongues. But to her surprise, Michael did the same. (laughs) We've got ourselves a tongues. Uh, yeah, and up till now, like, this is all goofy shit. Shit's about to get real serious here. Oh, gosh. Because think about this, right? This very awkward thing has happened. You're all trying to figure out a way to do They're all sitting in the room together, and you can just see Michael, like, making frowns. Yeah. Like, he's sitting there like, mm, uh. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of her being like, we're not horny for each other anymore, Marie just start, starts going, like, this is fucking... Weird shit. Yeah, yeah. real you, weird. His, you, his, uh, like it's silence. His face drops, and she just starts screaming at him in nonsense. He starts screaming back mm-hmm. at her in nonsense, and he later said that an evil force took over, and that mm-hmm. he suddenly had this vision of Marie standing in front of him naked, and when he looked down, he was naked as well. Then he blacked out. Ooh. What Michael missed was a full-on physical assault. He slapped Marie, then tried ripping her apart, started pulling her hair, and he's screaming in tongues as the rest of the prayer group, including his wife, is trying to hold him back, trying to pull him off. And Marie, she's just cowering in the corner. She's just saying Jesus over and over and over again. She's trying to fend off the attacks the best she could until finally Michael was pulled away. Michael came to his senses, and the police were called, but no charges were filed, and everyone just went home. Well, that's, yeah, how, what do you do back I, in the house? <laughs> I don't is, know. What well, does Christine was, say to the kids well, when it comes? They were at Michael and Christine's house. So God, everyone else is do left. this shit in your house. You gotta go. Yeah, that's really awkward. Like when a couple has a fight in front of you. and the, But that's, this is a lot worse than that even. <laughs> okay, time for us to go Gotta home. Go. <laughs> no, Gosh, no. Dinner isn't over yet. I made a creme brulee. <laughs> okay, well... Uh, Of course, this part of the story is pretty simple to figure out. Man develops a crush on a girl. Girl rejects man. Man reacts like a childish animal because he doesn't get what he wants. And as such, you know, we are by no means excusing Michael Taylor's behavior here. It's hard to believe that Michael Taylor would have reacted like this had Marie Robinson been leading a Bible study group where they all just sat in a folding chair circle calmly discussing scripture. Mm. See, when Marie Robinson introduced exorcism and demons into the group, she opened up a dangerous fucking door, as this was obviously a group of highly suggestible people looking for someone to tell them what to believe. Hmm. And when Marie introduced the concept of demons, inhibitions that may have prevented Michael Taylor from acting like this were suddenly subject to the supernatural. And he 
just like a lot of people in this world who commit terrible acts, he could now blame it all on the devil. Then, to make matters worse, Marie showed up on Michael Taylor's doorstep the morning after the attack to tell him that she forgave him for what he'd done because he hadn't been in control, which completely confirmed that it was not Michael, but the devil who mm. actually did it. And then, can you imagine being Christine Taylor? Ugh. This woman fucking shows back up after all of this shit and you're just like, just get the fuck out of here. We're done. We're done mm. with this shit. Yeah. Because that's what Christine Taylor said. She, she was, she had had enough of this shit. And I think that Christine and Michael had quite a long discussion after the sure. prayer group had left that night. Wouldn't so tell be me, that. Michael, I got a fun little question for you. Princess, but the devil now? No. <laughs> right? You possessed by the devil now? Tell me, tell me again. I want to see it. I want to see it again. You tell me. Look my eyes. Are you possessed by the devil right now? No. So we're gonna go watch American Horror Story. We're gonna catch up with the new season. Can we just go back to doing that, please? Yes. Oh, that's not so bad. Haunting on Hill House, by the way. Very good uh, television show if you want to binge that. Very good. I would recommend Very it good. as well. But yeah, so Christine Table uh, Taylor, like she just told Marie Robinson, like. You need to get out of here. You need to get out of here. You yep. need to leave us alone and right. never come back. Okay. But even though Christine Taylor was trying to minimize the impact of Marie Robinson, the damage had already been done. Uh oh. And there were still other people in town who are about to make it a whole lot worse. Why don't the people ever make it better? <laughs> Is that possible that they could do that? Yeah. They, I know, man. We're bad at it. I see. Yeah. Hey there, Marcus Sparks here for Quip. Something strange has been happening to you. Your plants have been dying. Old friends suddenly start avoiding you. And there seems to be something downright foul smelling in your apartment. No, you're possessed. You just haven't been brushing your teeth right. That's where Quip comes in. Quip knows most of us don't brush our teeth the way we should. So their team of dentists and designers built a better electric toothbrush. What makes Quip so ghoulishly great? Quip electric brushes have a built-in two-minute timer that pulses every 30 seconds to give you the heads up that it's time to switch sides, making sure you get your dentist recommended two minutes of brushing in and ensuring you get a full and even squeaky clean. Quip comes with a multi-use cover that sticks right to your mirror, shower wall, or just about anywhere and unmounts to slide over your bristles for fresh breath on the go. And you're going to want that cover because Quip is perfect to take along on all your adventures. Quip doesn't use a clunky charger and runs for three months on a single charge. Best of all, brush heads are automatically delivered every three months for just $5, making sure you keep your dentist happy by not using the same gross, same old gross toothbrush for years. Now I gotta say, I really didn't think that an electric toothbrush would fall under things that I can't live without, but Quip is so small and the charge lasts so long, now I can't imagine traveling for our live shows without it. You know, I used an electric toothbrush for a while, but the damn thing was so huge and bulky that I could never take it with me. I had to go back to regular old toothbrushes when we go out on the road. But now, with my Quip toothbrush, I can take it anywhere when we're out there in America entertaining you fine folks. And that's why I love Quip and why they're backed by over 20,000 dental professionals. Quip starts at just $25 and if you go to getquip.com slash last pod right now, you get your first refill pack for free with a Quip electric toothbrush. That's your first refill pack free at G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash last pod. So following the incident with Marie, Michael Taylor had a complete break from reality. First, he destroyed all the crosses and religious books in his home, reacting violently towards anything religious. Mm. After that, he started hanging around outside his house, acting erratically and telling his neighbors that he'd seen the devil. Uh-oh. Hey, 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 come. Hey, what you doing, Phil? How you doing? Hey, lawn's looking great. Hey, I saw the devil yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I could do a cartwheel too. Whoa! Whoop. Is that fun? I was like, I'm throwing French fries in the grass. I don't even know where I got the French fries from. I took them out of a garbage can. In England, fun. they call them chips. Isn't that wild? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And since this was a small town, word of Michael's behavior, including the night that he attacked Marie, reached the priest in charge at St. Thomas. Mm. 
That priest was Reverend Peter Vincent, who was a known exorcist in the Anglican Church who'd been performing deliverances for years on anyone whom he felt needed one. That is a coink a ding. <laughs> Look at that. A little bit. And when he heard about what happened and what was still happening with Michael, Reverend Vincent became convinced that a demon was on the loose. Hmm. So he and his wife took a trip over to the Taylor house. But when they got there, they found that Michael had flipped the whole thing. Now, Michael was saying that Marie had tried to seduce him Uh in front of his wife. And in addition to that, Marie was actually a closet Satanist. What? And Reverend Vincent believed every word. And that oh. belief was reinforced <laughs> by his wife, who absolutely despised Marie Robinson and Makes everything sense. she stood for. Well, I mean, honestly, I wonder if his wife was like, you better just call her a Satanist immediately and <laughs> denounce this woman. I mean, who knows? Maybe it was a, a, a dual plot. Yeah, I don't know, man. Well, both of them firmly believed that Marie had sicked a demon on Michael. Mm. Now, as Mark Hill points out in The Sussex Devils, and I think this is important to remember here, before all this happened, Michael Taylor didn't even go to church. Hmm. All this shit happened in the span of about two months. Now, is that a normal time, 31 years old, if you are like a schizophrenic or something like that? Would that be a normal? I thought it was the early it's 20s. It's much, much before that. This guy was not a schizophrenic. Okay. He, I, 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 do, I do not believe personally that he was a schizophrenic at all, because schizophrenia shows up in late teens early 20s and he didn't show any signs before that he had intermittent depression and even then it wasn't necessarily clinical depression it was more uh conditional depression okay and this guy after never going to church before this he was now becoming convinced that a satanist had planted a demon inside his soul yeah god don't eat any of the food at the potluck (laughs) that might have a demon seed in it but the thing was at this point Michael was at a crossroads. See, the Taylors, they were ready to go on a little holiday to try to clear their mind and return to the normal life they'd enjoyed before they met Marie Robinson and her little group. Hmm. Nothing like a carousel to just make you not horny for your priest anymore. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) But Reverend Vincent, he had other plans. Oh, no. See, there wasn't a chance that he'd abide a demon in his own backyard. So when he heard that the Taylors were planning on letting it all go, Vincent got a neighbor to convince them otherwise. And that neighbor was the same one who had brought them into Marie Robinson's group in the first place. It was Bob. I love it. I haven't seen me in a while. I have to know. You know, you flush your toilets a lot because I can hear through the walls. I heard there's a demon in the house and I've been talking oh to your priest and we all agree. You need to get your ass into an exorcism. What about Barb? I mean, come on. What about Barb? What about Barb? So rather than just letting them get back to their lives, Barbara Wardman convinced Michael and Christine Taylor to go visit Reverend Vincent at St. Thomas's Church on October 5th, 1974, without really telling him what they had planned. Uh oh. We're making spaghetti and meatballs? <laughs> you gotta come by. Hold Friday, on. it's gonna be fun. It'll be fun. They did a surprise exorcism? Yes. I don't yeah, know. Man. Got to. Very few things that should be surprise. Maybe a surprise baby shower. Yeah. The person knows they're pregnant, yeah. theoretically. Yeah. Surprise birthday! Yeah, you, you know, know it's your birthday. Not my favorite thing, but okay. It's still in the realm of possibility. A surprise exorcism is one of the most horrifying things. I can. Just imagine going, if like, Marcus, come on over for, for a Wrestlemania, uh-huh. but there's no wrestling on. And okay. it's just all of us and we're just like sit down <laughs> oh no no honestly it'd be kind of cool because i'd jump right in yeah i didn't even go bend the back bend the back your mother sucks cocks in hell your mother sucks cocks in hell my mom's still alive <laughs> well vincent he'd come ready as well he assembled a whole exorcism team calling over a methodist husband and wife exorcism duo named raymond and peggy from the next town over <sighs> This is great. I yeah. love like, Raymond and Peggy, man. <laughs> they got they got fanny packs. They're fully ready. For, it's all filled with all of their nooks and sundries for their exorcism. Well, Vincent's wife joined in as well, and they rounded it all out with a dude named Don James as an assistant. Hey, I'm Don. Hey, 
Me? <laughs> I don't do anything. I got a couple of dozen, uh, got a couple of dozen seltzers here. Got some. You guys want any snacks or anything? I made a kale salad. I don't know. It's I'm done. <laughs> Again, anything you need, just let me know. So they've assembled some sort of Avenger super troop here. Yeah. Of spiritual leaders, I guess. Yep. So when the Taylors showed up that night, the group sprung the trap. <gasps> this was not just a friendly meeting. This was an exorcism. Hold on here, guys. Now, Michael immediately reacted by throwing his tea in the reverend's face. Oh. Then he kicked the reverend's cat, and then he punched him in the face as well. If you throw, if you throw your tea in England, that's a felony. Honestly, the that's attempted murder. Because they keep that tea at like 290 degrees. That's why they have to sip it. Yeah. So the team grabbed Michael, tied him up, and laid him down on some floor cushions in an office in the church and waited for midnight to come. Why did you schedule this for nine? If you wanted this to be a midnight thing, you could have had us come at 11.30 because now I'm just struggling here. I'm going to be struggling for two and a half hours. You got me all mad? Yeah, and then Donna's like, at what point does this become kidnapping, everyone? <laughs> well, it was their professional opinion that there was an enormous evil emanating from Michael, and that evil was most likely because, unbeknownst to Michael, Marie had somehow pledged him to Satan. Oh, of course, of course. So starting at midnight, the exorcism team took turns drawing the demons out from Michael Taylor. They made him confess to sins he had never committed, and when he confessed to such sins, they shoved crosses in his mouth. <laughs> oh, wow. That'll work <laughs> every time. Then they took the last cross that Michael owned, a wooden crucifix he wore as a necklace, and they burned it oh. because they said that it had become infected by Satan. That was my cross. <laughs> Please stop burning my things. I'm ready to stop being a devil, a devil now. I'm ready to stop. No, nope, unfortunately, your couch, we also got to burn that. That, that has been infested. Please leave my things alone. My no. couch did nothing. It's always been there. You got the new it's flat always screen. supported me. New flat screen TV there? Possessed. <laughs> got to burn that. So after they burned his cross... They went down a list of demons that needed to be cast out, and they took care of the demons one by one. They took care of incest, bestiality, blasphemy, lewdness, heresy, masochism, and especially lust, as they'd all made their homes within the soul of Michael Taylor. And there's one demon just called Elton John. <laughs> Very interesting. It's a little bit funny. Thank you. Thank you. This feeling inside. And they just sit and let him do all of that song. But the thing was, they weren't saying he had necessarily committed all these sins. What they did believe is that without this exorcism, these demons would eventually cause Michael Taylor to commit each and every one of these sins to the fullest of their imaginings, using the same line of reasoning that Andrea Yates used to kill her five kids. Oh, my God. We're doing this for you. Yeah. This is all for you. Okay. This is, this is spiritual pre-crime. Mm-hmm. Now, I tried looking up a few of these demons in both my Dictionary of Demons and around the Internet to see who some of these guys were, and I got some very interesting results. Ooh. By Leth is said by some to be the demon of incest. But that might just be because of a 1972 Italian horror flick called Il Demoni dell'Incesto, which, according to a reviewer named Humanoid of Flesh, has <laughs> plenty of softcore sex and a whole bunch of full frontal nudity. Oh, okay. Noted. <laughs> I got that. Thank you for the review. Now, I could find no demon specifically of bestiality, but according to many of the Christian websites I visited devoted to such things, it is likely that the bestiality demon is a cat, because oh. there are apparently a lot of Christians fucking cats out there and blaming it on a bestiality demon. <laughs> Don't fuck the cat. <laughs> I don't really understand what's, what's even on? so sexually interesting about a cat. Uh. Its asshole's so small. I know that it's supposed to be tighter. Uh. I guess that's good. I don't think I it don't. is good because it's screaming and clawing you the whole time well, unless I... it's dead. Yeah. And then don't have sex with the dead cat. It yeah. will be dead if you do that. <laughs> yeah, just don't fuck the cat. Is this don't a PSA? Do we, is this an appetizer? We've done this before. We're saying it again. We always have to whip this out every couple of years or so. A refresher. Right. Leave the cats alone. That was brought to you by the state of New York, paid for by Andrew Cuomo. <laughs> Blasphemy, though, belongs to Bearbareth. Blarbareth? <laughs> 
<laughs> what is that? No, no, no. Barbarous. Barbarous. No, he calls Minister of Treaties. <laughs> Why'd you give me the fat name? You know I'm fat. <laughs> he is Hell's Minister of Treaties, Kissel. He is the notary for the devil. But yeah. he's definitely fat. Yeah. Notaries are notoriously large. Oh, yeah. He's the go between when a man sells his soul to Satan. I see. He's and literally what for your pretty face is going to hell. Yeah. He's like one of the people, one of those people he'd go where his job is to keep the files. Yeah. So he's an office worker in hell. So my my obese claim stands. Yeah. And lust, of course, belongs to Asmodeus, okay. who runs all of hell's casinos. Yeah, oh, also. I want to go. <laughs> yeah, like Steve Wynn. <laughs> oh, my God. Welcome Landis. to Wynn and Encore Resorts. Nothing but total opulence. This hero's sculpture has over 75,364 <laughs> individual roses, each piece of crystal shipped from all over the world, over 79,000. 495. <laughs> if you stay at the Encore or the Wynn Hotel in Vegas, they have this long thing with Steve Wynn where it's him describing each piece of of art in the casinos, and then he goes and he names each tiny particle that's in it. And the best piece of art, this toupee that I'm wearing. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as Michael Taylor went, Reverend Vincent said that in all, he and his team were able to extract... 40 demons hey. from Michael's soul by the time the sun rose on Yorkshire, eight hours after the exorcism began. <laughs> okay, pretty good, though. 40 in eight hours, that's a pretty good pace. And it's not bad at all. Yeah. Although 40 sounds like quite a few demons. That's a lot of demons. According to the Reverend, when the morning came, there were still three more to go. Okay. Oh, good. And as long as it's just the ones of, like, sleepy, sneezy, and hungry, <laughs> then we're fine. The thing was, the Deliverance crew, they were tired because oh. they'd been up all night battling the devil. Oh, of course. That's exhausting. Yeah. So I get it. It was agreed that all of them, including Michael Taylor and his wife, should go home, get a few hours of sleep, and they'd all meet back up that afternoon to take care of those last three demons. It's not yeah, a it's long only three left. <laughs> it's not a long game of Monopoly. Just finish the damn thing. No, they're tired. There's only three left. But if yeah. they can get to those. If yeah. they did 40 in eight hours, that's they got another 90 minutes of work to do. It's union. You don't oh, think these guys are not union? union? <laughs> yeah, that could be. Well, demonologists know these last three demons as Aishma, Kaasimolar, and Voso, we know them as anger, oh. insanity, and murder. Glad they <sighs> saved those for last. <laughs> Why didn't they get those out first? <laughs> they yeah, were tired. Union. Man, <laughs> they're fucking hands taking a break. <laughs> but here's the thing. It was with the knowledge that these three demons were supposedly still inside of him that Michael Taylor went home with his wife that morning. And this... So they told him. Yes. Yeah, they told him. Oh, they brilliant. Told idea. Him. Great idea. Now, there was actually one of them that tried to prevent this from happening. Margaret Smith, she claimed to have received word from the Lord that the spirit of murder was going to break loose that very morning. And she tried making that known before Michael left. But no one listened. No one, that is, except for perhaps Michael Taylor. She does that every fucking morning. <laughs> Could be. That's the thing. Is it... We've been having a good time here. This is when this story gets really fucking serious. So since Michael and Christine were absolutely shattered from a night of exorcism, Christine mercifully asked a family friend to take their five kids to stay with their grandparents while she and Michael rested for the day. Okay. Great. And we don't know exactly how events transpired between the time the children left and the time that Michael was next seen two hours later, because Michael claims that he remembers none of it. Okay. What we can piece together is this. When the two were finally alone, something came over Michael Taylor, just like it had when he attacked Marie Robinson 13 days before. At some point in those two hours, Michael stripped naked and attacked his wife Christine. But this time, there was no one to hold him back. He first reached into her mouth and ripped out her tongue. Oh. 
Then, as she lay on the ground, choking to death on her own blood, Michael Taylor gouged out her eyes and ripped her face to shreds with his bare hands, flinging strips of flesh around the room as they came free from her skull. He then turned on the family dog, ripping its legs from the sockets mm. before pulling out its tongue and eyes as well. He then wandered outside, still naked, covered in the blood of his wife and his dog. There's something about the tension before this moment that I feel like is the that that's what scares. Me. Obviously, again, we have been very goofy and it does feel very goofy. It feels like everybody's play acting. But that feeling again of, wow, Michael emerges from his room nude. He is the guy they saw in the room before when he attacked Marie imagining Christine, who at this point, I wonder how she's even feeling because it seems like she's half in and out of the exorcism thing even working like it seems like she's like whatever's gonna be she's kind of railroaded into this scenario and all of a sudden she's that sees that same change and that's got to be fucking mind-bogglingly frightening now of course the cops they were called as soon as someone saw michael taylor wandering around but Ugh. none of the callers mentioned anything about blood all they said was a naked man covered head to toe in red paint was wandering down the street it's not a Mentos commercial. Yeah. It's never painted. No. <laughs> but by the time the cops arrived, Michael had curled up into the fetal position on the ground. Now, it became very apparent to the first cop on the scene that Michael was covered not in paint, but in blood. Oof. And when Michael Taylor was asked whose blood it was, he started shouting over and over again one sentence. It is the blood of Satan! 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 Satan is not a poodle. It is the, <laughs> it is the blood of your wife and a poodle. Yeah. And when the verdict came down, Michael Taylor was found not guilty by reason of insanity. Wow. And, and was sent to Broadmoor Mental Hospital, England's most infamous holding pen for the criminally insane. Now to some, the Michael Taylor case was proof that religion and spirituality in the wrong hands could lead to untold horrors. Sure. As if we needed more proof of that. <laughs> right. <laughs> In fact, the debate as to whether exorcism should be banned altogether in England even reached Parliament. But to others, it was proof that demons were real. As Heal points out, many evangelicals had no problem with Reverend Vincent performing the exorcism. Their issue was that he'd stopped for a tea break. Every time. <laughs> you know what it is? When the Anglican wow. Church came forward and after this, they were like, we will need to create more, uh, like, we need to create an actual exorcism like system. Like, yeah. We need to train people. We need to do with it. But the main push from within the Ang Angelican Church to stop the exorcism schools from being made is that they said that it would destroy their idea of normalcy. Is that what they want is to be appear to be normal and right. put together and not look like a bunch of people hysterically uh, chasing after demons. So British Parliament was literally like on the docket today is should we ban exorcisms mm -hmm. following by. Uh, Followed by, uh, should we join the EU? What do you think, guys? <laughs> this doesn't yeah, seem. And be like, uh, yeah, um, I believe we have. Uh, is this uh, the wise uh, Sir Penningham is here to speak on behalf of exorcisms? Yes, yes, I would. <laughs> oh, your mother sucks cocks in hell. Your mother sucks cocks in hell. <laughs> <laughs> the thing was, oh my god, nobody on the periphery received any real comeuppance for their roles in Christina Taylor's death. Marie Robinson, she just kind of faded into obscurity, and she was never really seen in the public eye again after the trial. Okay. And unlike the case of Annalise McKell, in which a young girl's parents and two priests were charged with criminally negligent homicide following her starvation death during her exorcism... Reverend Vincent was actually promoted after all uh, of this. Failing upwards. Yeah, he went from priest in charge to vicar. Oh, wow, whoa. great. Yeah. So so he had to so it was the tea breaks that did it. It was leaving the last three 
worse demons <laughs> inside the man's body yeah. and then not saying, Do you think- oh, it's the demon of your laundry is still wet and even though it's been in the dryer for 55 minutes. Yeah, you know so what I mean? Do you think it really was the power of suggestion if they yes. weren't? Do you think so? I think so completely. But, I, mean, I think it's an interesting combo. Yeah, I mean, here's the funny thing that River Vincent said. I mean, not necessarily funny, but he said something to that same effect or at least questioned it. Reverend Vincent, he lived with himself using the same tactic that most of these guys do. Just throwing up his hands saying... It's all part of God's plan. Oh, of course. Yeah, he was. Ugh. Yeah, he was quoted as saying that he was quite convinced that God will bring good out of this in His own way. <sighs> he then added, "Quote: If the psychiatrist said this crime would not have been committed but for the exorcism, that seems a rather strange thing to say." <laughs> that's, a, that's the most normal thing that's been said so far. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. he, he just. He just. Shuffed it off. He's oh, just yeah, like, yeah, it. you know, God, yeah, g- g- God will make some good of it. It's <laughs> weird happen. that he would talk, that he would say the exorcism Strange. is, you know, a part of this. It's so weird. It seems like and that's the, the thing. Was only- like when I heard that he had literally gouged out the eyeballs of his wife and stripped the skin from her face with his fingernails instead of even a knife and then literally ripped the skin from her face, the first thing I thought was. Strange. <laughs> Very <laughs> weird. Very <laughs> strange like, wow. indeed. Perhaps tellingly, though, the Michael Taylor case was the last recorded Anglican exorcism in England. And as far as Michael Taylor's punishment went, he was back on the street in four years. Oh, oh yeah, that's all he needed, man. Oh, he just goodness. needed a breather. All right? Oh, right. He had a lot of shit going on. He right. just needed to cool do- his heels, do some reading, work out, do the La Machina yes. uh, in, the, in the yard. Do, do we know if he ever got the three out of him? Uh, yeah, I guess. Did he do something where he's like, oh, they're out of me now? No, I mean, he didn't say for sure. <laughs> okay. Just, I like, can feel like he sits in the, in the mirror. Like, he look sits in group therapy and they ask him that. It's like, do you feel that the demons have expressed from your body? And he's just like, hold on a minute. <laughs> All right. There goes one. <laughs> All right. It's strange. It's funny, uh, right? <laughs> having fun. Well, Micah Taylor did two years in Broadmoor and another two in a secure facility in Bradford before being set loose to blend back into society. Hmm. The reason why he was let loose is because Michael's doctors believe that Michael had hyperventilated during his exorcism, which caused a temporary break with reality. That, hey. combined with what they called hysterical pseudopsychosis, temporarily induced by his exorcisers, created within Michael something that may as well have been a fucking demon for all the damage it caused. Sir, so saying it's a demon. All right, I guess it is a <laughs> demon after all. Yeah, as far as what Michael's been up to since, he has pretty much spent the last 40 or so years trying to kill himself. Okay. Uh, tried everything from wrist cutting to bridge jumping. I think he's got four suicide attempts on his record. Uh, yep. He was last in the news in 2005 for indecently touching a teenage girl. Uh, but after that, who knows? I mean, he may have finally succeeded at suicide in the last 13 years, mm. or he may have died of natural causes, but chances are Michael Taylor is still alive somewhere in England, praying that his demons will never return. Ooh. I tell you what, now instead of killing my wife, I'm just killing it at the gym. <laughs> you should see me flip that tire. <laughs> All right, there it is, the possession of Michael Taylor. A lot of things went wrong there. But Many everything things. that could go wrong in an exorcism went wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Many things went wrong. And I mean, this is a fascinating uh, exorcism case because, it, I mean, yeah. it doesn't necessarily have uh, the the speak. It doesn't have, like, the strange languages or the superhuman strength or anything like that. Like, this is a, well, you know, it seems the, like an, uh, an outside-influenced exor- outside possession. Although it does seem like the, the ripping of his wife's face off and the tongue, that's a little superhuman. <laughs> oh, no, it's you can little. do that. You it's could go lot. home and do that to a human right now. Rip out the tongue? It's Either not, one of us, too. It cannot be it, that easy to rip out a tongue. Any one of us can. You can do it. <laughs> I can't do it. Believe in yourself, Kissel. I think that it's interesting. I believe this is, again, it's a 50... Uh, I mean, this is all opinions. Yeah. Every single time we talk about this kind of shit, I think that the idea of the man-made and the psychic mixed with the spiritual in a way, all collide together to make it real. That a part of it is the, the you have to you have to choose 
the behavior in order to make it real. I think that's a part of what, instead of it being these sort of anthropomorphized, like, things with uh, entities with personalities that exist inside of you, it's a chicken and the egg thing where those creatures, the idea of a demon, the idea of a, a negative entity, are there because of the actions of humankind and that the... the the fucking constant feedback loop is what sort of makes them real. Stuff like this makes them real because, in a way, you have named the demons, you've given them the thing, now they have fucking a body count attached to them. That's given them spiritual fucking magic juju. That's correct. Indeed, they are powerful entities. Be very careful with this stuff. This is all because the power of suggestions very, very real. I mean, yeah, it's not just. I mean, it's just. And you know, be careful with other humans, just with manipulation, with yeah. with how you treat other people, because you know the human mind is a fragile thing, and if you're fucking with the human mind and fucking with other people's emotions and their spirituality and their religion, uh, very dangerous things can happen. Yep. And if you're gonna leave a demon in, leave the ice cream demon in, because everyone <laughs> well, loves honestly, to have ice cream. I, for all the meals a day. I find it very interesting because we we like this shit. We like this type of drama. We talked about a little bit of this uh, when we were doing our discussions. It's kind of like methamphetamine. Is that when you get into meth, you add instant drama to your life. There's something about being boring. The idea of joining in all this kind of group activity too, the, between the the church and how everybody came together for the exorcism and like all these people paying attention to you. It's like he it was feeding into all of this. Well, shit. just get into football, European football here in the UK, <laughs> and then football. you can just be a fan about that. By the way, football also has a lot of body counts as well. Yeah. Speaking of uh, uh, energy there of people. Um, all right, everyone. Well, thank you all so much for listening. That was great stuff. Yeah, yeah, man. Great okay. story. What do we have to talk about? We have to talk about the little tour we're going on. Is everything we're sold to, out? I don't, I don't think so. I okay. think may, maybe, I know Chicago is and okay. uh, Austin might be, but I think we still got tickets for uh, Dallas, awesome. uh, Oklahoma City, great. and Indianapolis. Dallas and uh, Oklahoma City, that's going to be on the 7th and the 9th of November. Those are coming up very soon. Yes. Uh, the well, we got the DC first. Out. Well, DC is sold out as well yes uh, but it's important to remember so we constantly remind people dc's still on we're there november 4th and the rest of it's like yeah pick up tickets where you can get them because they will sell out yeah and we're gonna have a lot of fun yes yeah. cannot wait to see everyone on the road yeah it's gonna be a, yeah just go to last podcast on the left.com and there are uh ticket links uh to all of our uh, upcoming shows there there that is and, anything and, else here indianapolis is on november 30th i believe yes i uh, can't and wait to go guys, back to indy it's halloween this is the this is the fun weekend because you get to like just you get to party this weekend. So go dance, uh, cavort, wear your um, mass revel in your anonymity, and feel the presence of ghosts. As this Wednesday, the veil between the worlds is thinner than it shall be for the rest of the year. Too bad it falls on a Wednesday, but yeah. that's fine. That's fine. You know what? The demons can only do so much. Which uh, wins the party? Is it this weekend or is it next weekend? I this don't know. Weekend. You know what I noticed? <laughs> for me, it's Remember this how weekend. The Simpsons used to always do the Treehouse of Horrors the weekend after. Drove me kind of nuts. Mm. Now they do it the weekend before. That's nice. So I think that's better. It's much because better. Because once Halloween is over, now everyone's got Thanksgiving stuff up, and some folks even just jump right to Christmas. A lot of people jump so, right to Christmas. Yeah. But you know what? Yeah. If they want to jump right to Christmas, let them. Oh, I don't care. Do whatever the heck you do want to do. Do whatever the fuck it is they need to do. Yeah, you know, man. I don't need to see all these turkeys all around making me all hungry every step I take. Mm. I just miss. It's skeletons, and then it's nothing but plump food. Yeah. It is like, it's October <laughs> to November is totally different. Mm. Skeleton's great for my diet. Yeah. That's something to aspire to, Wonderful. which I'm not doing a good job of. That's fine. It's fine. Um, all right, everyone. Check us out on Instagram. Uh, ben Kissel one Marcus Parks for everything. Marcus Parks. Dr. Fantasty. Henry Loves You on Twitter. Yeah, and then, all the fucking what are bullshit. We? Last podcast on the left. Uh, all the things you can find give us. us money on patreon if you feel that we deserve it yes we're, well, thank you all so much for we're doing working that. hard to give you as much fucking bullshit as we can sling at you mother fox okay well so, i don't know why you're aggressively yelling at you them fucking you, you, just, you asked for money in there. you asked Ooh. i don't know what don't, don't you, yell at the people who pay who help pay yeah, our rent it was a, it was a like strange them. strategy to request money and then call them fucks i felt like i was on the l train <laughs> uh which is good hail satan yeah and, and for our patreon this week we have a great interview with the guy who uh wrote the book automating humanity uh really uh, joe toscano so uh check out that interview henry and i always love to do those and we try to do one every week yeah um, all right everyone hail yourselves hail satan hail game patreon.com slash last podcast on the left Ooh, magustalations hail me with your dollar bills please <laughs> and thank you to everyone who gives already of course and happy halloween 
Oh my gosh. Happy Halloween.